Good afternoon and welcome to our third session on today's full set of webinars on Community Energy for Energy Solidarity. We're a Horizon 2020 funded project that is investigating the degree to which energy communities, communities already do or would like to start taking action to tackle energy poverty. Our aim is to help identify which measures are most effective uh, and we, we're really looking at the themes of energy poverty, energy uh, communities, and energy solidarity. Uh, I'm Marilyn Smith from the Energy Action Project. We report on energy poverty throughout the EU on our website, Cold at Home, which is www.coldathome.today. Our role within the CEASE project is to manage communications and dissemination. And I'll be moderating this session as I have the other sessions as well. Um, uh, and what we'd like you to do is uh, not only pay attention to the presenters, but be very active in the chat we have open. We'd like you to tell us who you are and where you're from and what organization you represent. If you have any questions while the presenters are talking, then please just pop those in and we'll bring them up during the Q&A session later on. Uh, and also be active on Twitter or whatever other social media channels you are uh, on and can, can let people know what we're talking about today. If you weren't able to attend the first two sessions, I'll just quickly tell you what uh, they were about. The first one was covering uh, the who the partners of CIS are and what our principal themes are. As I said, that's community energy, uh, energy poverty, and energy solidarity. And in that first session, we talk about each of those in more depth. Uh, the second session was more about how do you identify the people that are in energy poverty in a given community or the vulnerable households and also how do you engage not only with those community those people but also with the other stakeholders in your community who can help you access or bring better services to that uh, to the vulnerable households uh, this session we're going to focus on the kinds of actions that you can actually do to alleviate energy poverty and we're going to do a couple of things here. One is, first of all, I'm just going to give you uh, a quick, quick overview of each of the partners who are actively doing that within the CIS uh, the CIS consortium. Uh, and then we're going to hear from a couple of partners in more depth about how they are either taking soft measures or hard measures. And we define the difference between those as soft measures are things where you, um, you know, you might help people gain new knowledge or a little bit more um, skill in, in using energy in their homes, or you might help them find out more about what services they're eligible for. Hard measures are more directly, uh, how, do, how do we do something in, in, in a person's home to in, improve the efficiency of that home? Uh, and so we're gonna hear from groups that do both of that. And uh, so I'm just gonna, as I said, I'm gonna jump in now and give you a very quick overview for those of you who didn't join one of the sessions earlier today give you a quick overview of the CIS partners who are taking action to alleviate energy poverty. So CIS uh, is, as I said, it's Community Energy for Energy Solidarity. Oh, sorry, I forgot a couple of logistic things. Um, please keep your microphones and videos off so we can uh, avoid bandwidth problems, but do participate very actively in the chat um, we'd like to know who you are and where you're from as a first thing. And then throughout the whole session, if you have a comment or a question that you want to add in response to something the presenter has said, just please go ahead and do that. Um, we, we think webinars are an interesting opportunity because you can chat in the background while somebody's presenting, <laughs> which you would be impolite in person. But um, we more than welcome it here. Uh, and we will present in this particular session, we'll have a Q&A after the first two presentations, which are going to be about soft measures, and then a second Q&A uh, after the last presentation. And I suspect you may be able to hear my cat whining in the background. This is the time of day he, where he would most like my attention, um, but I'm going to try to talk quickly and keep him pretty quiet during this. So um, here's just an overview of who are the members of CIS and what their energy solidarity mechanisms are. Enercoop Ener and Energy Solidaire are both French-based uh, cooperative. And Enercoop Ener produces and sells electricity and Energy Solidaire is working on how do we 
act in a um, more cohesive way with energy. So I'm going to start with them. Um, so Enercoop and Energy Solidaire support energy finance action. They finance action against energy poverty in two ways. One is by collecting micro donations on energy bills. So they do have a large, a fairly large client base and all of those clients can uh, make a micro donation on their energy bills. The second thing they do is direct the value of surplus energy into energy donations. And this is a more complicated thing, so I'm not gonna to try to explain it. I think that later we'll hear from somebody who can do it better. Part of what all of the CEASE partners have to do is pilot something that they haven't done before. And it should be something that one of the other CEASE partners has experience in. So we're gonna, you know, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about who, what, what each partner is piloting and who they were inspired by. So uh, Enercoop and Energy Solidaire want to better help the customers they have who are vulnerable. And to do that, they're going to train employees to better understand who is energy uh, in energy poverty and how to assist them. They're going to engage with other entities who can help uh, launch programs. Sorry, I need to just... Uh, and, and provide better access, and they're inspired by Ali Energy and Repowering London, which you will both hear about in a minute. So Repowering London, uh, or perhaps Repowering, is a community engagement, uh, is the, the skill set that they bring to CIS. They engage by through diverse actors to leverage services and financing available in the community, and they engage directly with vulnerable household, households to boost their energy knowledge and know-how and to empower them to act as agents of change. And we heard from Repowering earlier this morning. What they're gonna pilot is the support part of the CEASE range of things that we do. They're gonna add micro donations uh, and potentially the energy surplus and other models to build up their funding schemes. And they're inspired by Energy Solidaire and Energy Enercoop. Ali Energy works in Scotland and they uh, work specifically with very remote uh, and rural communities in the Western islands of Scotland. Um, they really bring innovative approaches to identifying who is in energy poverty. We heard this morning about how they identify the light moments when someone's energy use and energy expenses might change, such as when you've had a new uh, a baby or you've lost your job or when there's uh, been a death in the family. They're also very good at the ACT part of it. They off already offer lots of advice and home visits, and they do training for energy advisors. Um, they help people learn better energy behaviors, and they deliver energy savings kits. Uh, and they also have a very strong engagement process of uh, working through referral networks with other organizations, such as public health providers and social services and those kinds of things. So that's the skill set they bring. What they're going to pilot is, again, the support aspect of this. They want to boost their financial security by implementing micro donations and also looking at other, other fundraising schemes. And they're inspired by Enercoop, Energy Solidaire, and also Repower in London. Uh, ZEZ or ZEZ is uh, one of the partners who is already an energy community, but until recently has not been involved in energy poverty. Um, so they're very good at the actor engagement part from the very first time they launched uh, their, their call for investors for energy, uh, an energy community in Croatia. Uh, they had a very high level of engagement very quickly. Invest investors were keen to advance a just clean energy transition and local entities were ready to tackle energy poverty. Um, what they need to learn to do within the, the CIS program is to identify the vulnerable households. They're going to act, they're going to train young people as energy advisors to visit homes and to implement energy efficiency kits. They also are going to work on the support part in terms of implementing micro donations. So again, they were inspired by Energy Solidaire and Enercoop. Um, and I think they've also been inspired by Ali Energy uh, and Repower in London, which don't show up there. But everybody's, you know, everybody's inspiring each other. Cooper Nico is very much like 
uh, ZEZ, Cupinico is operating in Portugal and has been doing cooperative loans for energy communities for some time already. Um, sorry, my phone keeps falling. Uh, so low interest loans um, for renewable, renewable energy sources, two cooperatives to install solar PV on the roofs of charities. And this, the idea of this is then that leaves more of each charity's budget available to provide services rather than pay energy bills. Um, they also have other members for um, self-consumption of ener uh, or energy of self-consumption or energy efficiency measures. So they, as we heard from Zhao this morning, they've been active in the energy poverty space without actually necessarily calling it action on energy poverty. But they are now keen to be directly engaged in energy poverty, identifying the vulnerable households, acting to build knowledge and know-how of people through energy cafes and for by home visits where they'll implement simple measures for to improve energy efficiency or help with energy savings. As the, with the others, they're keen to learn more about funding and seek partners to finance their activities and they're inspired by ZEZ and they set them. And Les Setvents is based in France and their expertise is a renovation program that's called Shared Supported Self-Renovations or 3SR. They're very good at identifying vulnerable households. They're very good at acting. Uh, and this includes both hard and soft measures to improve the energy efficiency in people's homes and to boost energy know-how. Uh, and they're good at engaging diverse actors and building up community among people who may or may not be energy poor, but live in the same region. What they're interested to do in their pilot part is to support, uh, again, the, the support project. How do they scale up 3SR uh, appropriately and test it by testing funding strategies and engaging more actors? And they're inspired by Ali Energy, Repowering London, Energy Solidaire, and Enercoop. And so that's the story of who our partners are. and what they bring and what they plan to do within the context of CIS. So at this point, we're going to uh, transition over to the presentations on acting, taking action to alleviate energy poverty through hard and soft measures. And we're first gonna hear from Rachel McNichol at Ali Energy. And for those of you who weren't uh, participating this morning, Ali Energy, as I said a minute ago, operates in Western Scotland, where people live in remote and rural areas. Rachel brings uh, has been with Alley Energy since 2010 and is currently the deputy, deputy manager and affordable wealth warmth team leader. She's in charge of day-to-day -day management of, uh, and monitoring and uh, responsible for training a lot of people. So Rachel, if you're ready, I'll hand over to you. Okay, thanks, Marilyn. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to cover the soft measures that we offer, which are training energy advisors to deliver energy advice and distributing energy kits. Um, the introductory slides I have here are a repeat from this morning, so if you'd like to know more about our work with energy poverty in Scotland, um, you can check out the recording from this morning's sessions. So I'll jump straight to training our energy advisors. So we have paid staff trained as energy advisors. They must all complete and pass the City and Guild's Energy Awareness and Home Qualification. Depending on project funding and priorities of projects um, at the time, they may also complete the City and Guild's Renewables and the Home course. Um, some advisors do go on to complete the Domestic Energy Advisor training, so they are qualified to carry out energy performance certificates. Again, that's funding dependent on um, project priorities. After their formal qualifications, they must carry out in-house training to learn our processes, how to use our case management system, and then spend some time shadowing our, our advisors before taking on cases themselves. Um, through the recent years where our demand has increased, we've had to prioritise cases, um, and we've found that giving our more experienced advisors um, the more complex and time-consuming cases allows our newer advisors to work through the easier cases faster. Um, our team, our advisors work remotely at home across the area that we cover. Um, so we have weekly online catch-ups um, where advisors have the opportunity to share challenges they are facing um, or ask for a second opinion on any cases they have. Um, that started as a social catch-up during the pandemic, but we've kept that going 
um, and used it as a, an opportunity to, to share good practice and ask questions between the team. Um, we encourage continuous professional development so that our advisors can keep up to date with the energy sector and ensure the advice they are providing is accurate. Um, we've also, um, I would say more so in recent months, um, organised more health and wellbeing sessions for our own staff to ensure they're looking after themselves as, um, because working with our vulnerable client group can be extremely hard on individuals. Um, in the past, we've trialled training volunteers to, um, and found training a volunteer to be a qualified energy advisor it just doesn't work for us. Um, as their time and availability doesn't align with the urgent nature of some of our client inquiries. And the energy advice sector is just too big a subject to expect a volunteer to take on. Um, we do offer a one day stay warm, stay well session for volunteers. So they have basic energy efficiency knowledge and understanding to help people um, with basic advice and also to refer people to, into our service for a session with our paid advisors. Our volunteers currently help us to pack and distribute our cosy kits, which I'll go into more detail later. Um, they've reported to us this activity is rewarding because they can see people appreciating the delivery of the kits and they see the difference they are making um, by volunteering for us. We also train people um, who we think are key in our communities. These tend to be other support workers and organisations, like I mentioned this morning. Um, and these people are working with the vulnerable people um, or people experiencing life changes as we went through earlier today. But we also have trained local councillors and individuals who want to help family, friends and neighbours. Um, so that training session um, is really a, a kind of basic um, level that can, that can um, be done with, with anyone. Um, our training helps people to spot fuel poverty, where to refer and signpost for help. Um, and we also provide them with basic energy saving behavioural advice um, so that they can provide that themselves and highlight the support Ali Energy can access so they can help us to spread the awareness of our service. Training paid staff, volunteers and key people in communities helps us to reach more people. Some of these people may benefit from the basic energy advice given by a volunteer and they won't need to come um, to have a session with um, one of our paid advisors, um, but others will be referred into the service to be given in-depth basic advice. Yeah, sorry, bespoke advice. Each individual has their own network um, of people in contact, so that helps us to spread awareness um, so we can be sure the work we do with them will reach far more people um, that need our help. Since we cover such a large area, our paid staff work remotely to service their localities so that we have a good coverage across the west and north of Scotland. Um, so therefore, they work from home. We need to put more time and effort into supporting these home working staff um, so they don't feel isolated. It's important we recognise that they play a key part in the overall team. Um, we work with extremely vulnerable clients and listen to heartbreaking situations sometimes. The level of support we can offer is capped, so it can be hard to tell someone there's nothing else we can help with or that our service isn't the most appropriate help for their situation. Um, so we need to make sure our staff's own health and well-being needs um, are supported. There is a constant change in the funding available in our field, so we need to make sure the advice we are giving is up to date and relevant. Um, so again, that's why we encourage continuous CPD. So if we move on to the, the energy kits, before the pandemic, we provided energy kits which may include light bulbs, chimney balloons, radiator backed foil, timer switches and cold alarms. These are made up um, specific to each household and the needs of the householder and required a house visit and energy assessment to determine which items were necessary. During lockdown, we were unable to visit people at home, so I had to rethink the items we provided in our kits so the items didn't go to waste. We renamed them the cosy kits and included items like hot water bottles, blankets and heat holder socks, which anyone could benefit from. These can also be distributed by other organisations on our behalf. And as I mentioned this morning, we're a good conversation starter with individuals. The items within the kit can help people keep themselves warm if they're struggling to heat their own home, their whole house. Since introducing our cosy kits, we've seen an increase in inquiries from other organisations wanting to partner with us and help to distribute the kits to their clients. We've noticed people contact us to thank us for the items and then ask for help. It's likely these people may have never known about us or felt uncomfortable 
um, asking for help without the kits. The kits are a simple and relatively cheap way to help people feel good by receiving something helpful. We found having a supply of kits with us at events attracts people to our stand and prevents the image that we are trying to sell energy to them. It emphasises that we are a charity wanting to help people. The kits provide immediate comfort and warmth, which is beneficial to the householder. They may have to wait weeks or even months in some cases for a successful outcome with insulation or heating improvements. The cosy kits may look like an easy activity to deliver, but there are some challenges. As a charity working to promote sustainability, we have found it difficult to source environmentally friendly items that come within budget to help the amount of people we need to support. We don't want any of the items going to waste, so encourage recipients to pass them on to items, pass on items to friends and family if they aren't of benefit to them. Over the last year, we found the price and availability of items can change quickly, so be sure to consider this in your budget and project plan if you're considering. Um, adopting a similar approach with energy kits. And sourcing items within budget can be time consuming and ordering bulk numbers can prove difficult when it comes to delivery and storage. Um, luckily, during lockdown, all our office-based staff were working from home, so there, we could use the office as a, a warehouse really. Um, but now that people are starting to work back from the office, it's proven difficult um, keeping the, the items for the kits um, and still having a nice working environment for those working from the office. Um, so we need to make sure we have space to store the items as well as space and access for staff and volunteers to pack up the items and get them out to the people that need them. Despite these challenges, the cosy kits have been really popular and it's rewarding to see how appreciative individuals are of such a simple offer. Um, Ali Energy hopes to bring our experience of delivering energy poverty projects in rural, remote and island areas and we're, we're happy to share good practice for engaging with different groups of people at various stages in their lives when we need help with energy. Thanks for listening and I'll welcome any questions during the Q&A session. Excellent. Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, and uh, Rachel, Rachel very kindly agreed at, at the last minute to do that presentation. So I'm very, very, very grateful. Um, as Rachel said, we'll do a, or and I said too, we'll do a second Q&A, or first Q&A after the second presentation, and then we'll do a second Q&A at, at the end of the, the session, uh, this, this, this particular session. So now we're gonna move on to Cooper Nickel, who I introduced you to as uh, an energy community that has existed for a while. Um, with doing cooperative loans and installing solar energy systems on charities and for communities. Um, and I'm going to introduce you now to Zhao, who is the Communications and Social Projects Officer at Cooper Nickel. He's a sociologist who is currently responsible for internal and external communications at the cooperative. Uh, and in addition to managing CIS, he's involved in a, in, or has Co Cooper Nickel's role in a second Horizon 2020 project, which is called PowerPort. Uh, so Zhao, off to you. Hello again for everyone. Thanks. Uh, I will share again my screen. Um, okay. So um, for those of you who haven't been in the first session, I am Joao. Uh, I work in the social projects related to energy poverty. That's that uh, Copernic has, uh, and Copernic is a nonprofit, national wide cooperative that is focused on empowering people in the energy sector while producing, selling, and providing energy services to our members. And we are currently the only nonprofit supplier of renewable energy in the country. Uh, so I'd like to start by saying that energy communities are about more than just producing energy. And this is something important to say because it's easy, at least here, people kind of just see their production part. Uh, and this session is about what we will do in our pilot project that is inspired in something that some communities do. And that is important to, know, to not lose sight of when we think of energy communities. So um, again, they're not necessarily about producing energy through a collective self-consumption. They really can be 
any energy collective initiative envisioning um, a better life for its members. Uh, and so uh, the, in this case, uh, these initiatives can be creating workshops, energy cafes, and other engaging activities to the community. Um, oh. Having troubles with the slides. Okay. So, um, energy advice <clears throat> that uh, is given through these workshops is uh, we are aiming to boost energy literacy, which can be divided into energy knowledge and energy know how. So, this is a twofold thing. Um, and this is something that's really noticeable in our partners' work and in conversations we've been having with the University of Birmingham, which is that um, one session about energy um, is probably not enough to bring about meaningful change in people's lives. It can act as um, an awareness catalyst, but we need to go from the brain to the hands. Uh, that's how we really learn. And, and there's actually a really interesting article in C's blog about the difference between energy literacy and energy know-how that says that, um, well, energy knowledge is about raising awareness and energy know-how is what really prompts change at the household level. And uh, when we were discussing our pilot with Kevin from the University of, Bam of Birmingham, he really insisted there should be some kind of continuation after these uh, cafes. And it is actually something that our inspiring case studies do. It's not just about teaching, but it's also about contacting directly with people, preferably with home visits, but not necessarily. It, can, it, it needs to be an individual contact. Mm -hmm. But this is sometimes is we can attain that just with a telephone uh, if a home visit is not possible. Um, so yeah, they will have this this um, pilot will have a component of an energy cafe that's a workshop and a follow up individual contact. So and in this way we will try to have both the benefits of energy knowledge and the energy know-how raising awareness and prompting change so um in the energy cafes uh we got inspired by many of our partners that do workshops in some way or another as a way to empower people um and actually this uh as in the same way that there are not many energy communities in Portugal, there uh, there's also not. Um, this is also not a very common approach in Portugal. Um, our sessions are called "Spend the Energy Well," "Gastar bem energia" in Portuguese, and and this name I must say came from a conversation with my colleague in Powerpool, Katarina. Uh, I, I don't know, I don't remember where she got it, but um, she probably in a webinar like this, she saw some organizations saying that we don't want to teach people, we don't want to teach how to reduce, we want to teach how to spend the energy you have. And I, I think that this is really a brilliant way to summarize what it means to tackle energy poverty. Because sometimes it will actually be about increasing the consumption of energy. And sometimes this is inevitable. Uh, and it's it also is important because it changes the mindset. It's focus on energy serving people and not the other way around. Um, and we call this uh, knowledge sessions, energy cafes because we want to create an informal setting in which people are supposed to feel comfortable, equals. It's like a conversation between equals, as if almost as if it was a chat with friends in a cafe. Obviously, it's got some differences, 
because we will be presenting prepared things, but we want to be sure that people don't feel like we are telling them what to do because we know better. We don't know better. Sometimes they actually know better. <laughs> we we want this to be more like an exchange. Um, and we want people to think about their own situations or their neighbors. We want to activate um, their learning skills through them thinking about their practical experiences. Um, so, yeah. We, we want to resonate with their experiences. And uh, finally, we want we are actually now, we are aliasing with local partners, namely an energy agency in um, the south margin of the Lisbon metropolitan area that comprises of four municipalities. And we are counting on their local experience to have these workshops. We will be, they will be helping us uh, make 11 different workshops across these four different municipalities, mainly in spaces belonging to local associations. And uh, they are really excited and are uh, being really helpful. Uh, just yesterday, I, I had a conversation with Susanna that's helping us with uh, this. But there's this dependence on third parties may also be challenging. Um, and for us, it is because they have a lot of work uh, and the workshops ended up being a bit dragged in time. We had to delay them. So, um, yeah, it's, it has benefits, but can also come with some challenges. Um, and now about the home visits. The, energy know-how part um well that they will start already in the workshops and at the end of the workshop people will enroll in some kind of individualized contact um and in in the visits will it will be a way to really assess what the situation is and uh, what we can do to help and we will try to um, implement some measures, uh, whether it is small appliances from an energy box or energy kit like uh, Ali Energy and ZZ have, or with uh, bigger things like windows funded with the efficiency voucher that we will be helping people to apply for in the visit. Uh, this this efficiency voucher um, has had some troubles beginning because uh, people had some difficulties with the bureaucracy and there's a, a high demand um, for installer co companies and they just they can choose not to to help uh, people that enroll in this efficiency voucher because of the bureaucracy it involves. And uh, to counter that a bit, we ourselves registered as a supplier, subcontracting um, installer companies so that we do the administrative work and hopefully it will help us uh, to be able to, be able to um, implement more measures in this pilot. Um, so, yeah, I think that wrapping up, uh, we try to um, leverage benefits of both approaches, the best of both worlds. Um, we already have some experience with workshops about energy efficiency and Carla that will be helping us with our pilot uh, had been doing that in 2016. Uh, it was called Tupperwatt, but it was more about energy efficiency than energy poverty, and it was not directed to energy poor people. Uh, and we already have some experience with home visits in Power Poor. So I think that in this pilot, we will be able to join both and get the best of both worlds, because I think that 
the connection we will be having from one thing to another. So we'll activate the energy knowledge part. And then the same people that already met us and hopefully trust us, we will follow up with them and uh, activate the more hands-on energy know-how. Um, so yeah, I think this connection from one thing to another will be really valuable to the pilot. Um, and that's it. I, I may, maybe I, I still have some time, but please ask questions. I, I usually don't take up too much time in presentations, <laughs> <laughs> as you might have noticed. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> uh, we do have a bit of time, but we also, uh, I put into the chat the question of whether anybody had experience in energy cafes who might like to share some uh, ah. some experience or what what worked well and what didn't and um petra are you willing to turn on your microphone and let us know a little bit about your experience hi there hi thank you hello <laughs> connection with portugal um Hello. um i've organized uh, energy cafes for some years um i organize it um being a member of the energy um uh, co cooperative cooperative of the local cooperative and um well each um energy cafe differs but um um well we are i i organize it with with a group of people and uh i, th I think about the team and then we ask uh three members or three people who want to tell a little about it and um they have to talk only 10 minutes that, that's not much and uh, but afterwards uh, all visitors can ask them questions and they can ask them when he's still uh, in front of of telling but also uh after that when he's drinking his, his beer or his wine or something so uh, we share the, um, the the meeting moments uh, with your neighbors, but also with um, the, the people who are telling, uh, with uh, drinking, and that is free, and, um, and having some nuts, and yeah. Um, so that's how we organize it. And um, uh, two weeks ago, we had um, uh, Energy Cafe, cafe about... Um, uh, help us uh, my um uh, energy uh, pay um paper how do you say it my tax my, Your energy um, bill? Yeah. what i have to pay to the energy um is 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 arising what what do i have to do so um a lot of people came but not really the people uh dealing with the uh, energy poverty so um yeah th that's a good lesson for next time do you, that's, can you that's, understand me? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, so if you organize energy cafe, um, uh, do it with a group. Do it. Um, invite all people of your uh, local communities. Um, it's it's important they meet and they speak with the neighbors about um, the the solar level, solar f f fields, or th something what's happening. Um, um, keep the presentations, keep them very short uh, and make uh, the idea of uh, getting them in contact with uh, uh, the speakers in contact with all the other people. So keep it low level. I think that's the best um, uh, point of success of an energy cafe. Great. Good. Thank you. Great. Does anybody have... Um, th does anyone else have a question or a comment uh, specific to these different kinds of soft measures that we've heard the two presentations about so far? Okay, I'm going to, I posed another question in the, the chat that I'm going to let you think about. Ma the end. May, I, may I answer sure. a little bit to Petra? So Yeah, yeah. Um, regarding to um, you said that you had some trouble getting to energy poor people that people getting to your energy cafes were not people really suffering from that 
and uh, we already have that experience also it's really hard it's it's a well and in CIS we have uh, partners that have a lot of experience with that too so um, that's why and as, as as i said in the previous session we are li li liaising with uh, local partners and this local partner has connections with the municipalities that in their turn have connections with uh, so with their um, social assistance you know social department action social action departments that that we are hoping can really get more people that will benefit from these workshops more than of course everyone can benefit from them but uh, we'd really like to reach those people that don't usually go into these sessions and um yeah, but because that's also a challenge that we are having in PowerPoor, because we do home visits also in PowerPoor, and uh, it's hard to get to those people. So, yeah, I think it might help to really be in contact with people that already and associations that already know, like Ali Energy does. They uh, have a connection with this as rachel was presenting with these associations that deal with changes in people's lives that l usually lead people to energy poverty so we hope to to also benefit from that great all right we are going to go on to the next presentation but i also put a, another question in the chat that i'd really be interested to hear if anybody else is doing energy kits like and Ali Energy described. I'm curious if anybody includes different kinds of content based on where you are geographically or what segments of the population you're, um, you're providing these kits to. I'd be really interested to hear if kits need to be um, tailored to the, to the local context. Um, so now we're gonna move on to hard measures. Uh, and we've had several people discuss this morning that you know, really a, the way to solve energy poverty is to fix people's leaky houses. Um, even, and that's true even in Portugal where the weather is not particularly cold, but nobody has, uh, very few homes have central heating and almost nobody has insulation. So there's, there's this cultural expectation of being cold in the winter. Um, but we're going to move to France now, and we're going to hand the floor over to Les Sept Vents, which is a cooperative that works with both people who are vulnerable to energy poverty, but also offers their services just to the broader community. Uh, and we're going to hear from Sabrine, who recently joined uh, Les Sept Vents. Um, and Sabrine, I'm just going to hand it right over to you so you can go ahead. Okay, thank you. So now you are seeing my screen, I hope. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Super. So for more of a context, uh, among the activities of Les Advents, uh, we have um, a mission to advise individuals in energy renovation. So uh, this is a public service delegation through which we are approached by individuals wishing to renovate their homes and home. We can advise on work to be done in order to reduce their energy bills uh, but also we can um, help uh, them find the aids from the state that can be mobilized during the renovation. Um, among the files we support, uh, some may uh, be directed uh, to the 3SR concept, which I will explain later, uh, because this concept may help them uh, reduce the costs of the renovation and also uh, sometimes the expectation and waiting for the craftsmen, uh, especially since the COVID crisis. So for starting, what is 3SR? 3SR is shared and supported self-renovation. Uh, it's a renovation of the houses that are carried by the inhabitants, uh, may they be owners or not. Um, this, help, this action aims to improve the housing conditions 
and uh, it is uh, supported by a building professional that has uh, all through the process uh, an eye on what's happening in the building and uh, the um, uh, supported uh, the shared part is uh, because we we have volunteers on site during step of the renovation so it has um, a social and uh, heritage value also because it's in renovation uh, sometimes that is sorry um, because i don't see really with my screen it's better now uh, so the renovation is intended uh, for people that are in precarious situations, not only uh, in energy poverty, but in social uh, poverty. And uh, the main objective of this is also to respect environment and heritage value in the building. In this later. Before I uh, go to the Norman uh, context, um, I wanted to share some other I hope you hear me. My connection is not stable. Uh, can someone confirm that the sound is You're still good. okay? Yeah, okay. Perfect. So I wanted to share some examples from across the Mediterranean. And uh, I, I chose to focus on the Twiza. Uh, so the Twiza is an interesting um, uh, is an interesting example because um, it's uh, sorry, it's a practice that is orin originating from North Africa, and it is not limited to the renovation of buildings, um, but it's an action of uh, a, a group that get, get together uh, in a community to uh, for a temporary uh, mo for a little moment. It's not um, it's not an association or organization, but it's just. Uh, some people getting together for one action. It can be to help uh, with the harvest of a field or the renovation of a building. And uh, in the case, uh, in the image that you can see, uh, it's for harvesting and processing olive oil. Uh, generally, this uh, action is a festive moment and people share the food uh, for the day. Now, our concept. Um, it started in the um, ah, in the national and natural park of uh, Les Marais de Carentan. Um, in this case, uh, it's uh, oh, sorry. So in this case, um, we have. Uh, an action that is uh, a lot involved in helping to renovate very precarious habitats in high heritage high value. And uh, Les Cesvon, uh, with the European Project Helps, have made it possible to formalize the practice by identifying the mechanism, uh, the advantages of this model, and the tools and skills necessary for the proper imp implementation. From this concept, we have a European network that was formed and it's uh, called Hands for Homes. Uh, the, for, for Leson to make uh, the TRIASAR more understood and more um, valuable in the process of renovating uh, homes and uh, at a larger one, wide than uh, in Le Parc, uh, Le Parc des Marais, is uh, the um, participation to the CIS project. Um, concerning the advantages of um, the 3 SR, you have a uh, development of social cohesion, and it's one of the most important things that can happen during a 3 SR process. Um, it's, it has a good impact on the local uh, economy because uh, it solicitates more uh, local craftsmen and uh, the purchase of materials uh, are more in natural uh, materials than in classical materials for innovation. Um, so this uh, gives us uh, a positive impact uh, of the process and the practice. Uh, the preservation of enhancement of the construction heritage in of the emerging of the concept and um, it helps also people to get more uh, knowledge uh, during the 
the workshops and because they can talk with craftsmen and learn more methods. And it's uh, one of the best improvements uh, that we have uh, during this process. All um, the 3SR concept is uh, oriented to um, improve the quality of life of the occupant of the housing. So we have some uh, positive elements that emerge from this action on different scales. Um, the most noticeable of them is uh, the creation of a network of volunteers through uh, the Enerta Association in Normandy. Uh, local authorities support this, uh, uh, this action by uh, the financing of uh, 3SR actors and uh, they all launched an initiative to study the possibilities of integrating this practice into public schemes for assistance of uh, renovation. Um, it is important um, for the, this work to, to grow uh, to keep in mind that lesson, uh, lessons learned from other regions uh, during the exchanges. And uh, what we have identified uh, at the settlement um, is uh, that it is important that more and more people and actors understand and engage in this practice at the territorial level. Uh, it's also important to integrate social partners and local authorities who can invest in uh, this support and um, the key element right now is that uh, the skills and trainings are really important. This element joins the um, actions targeted by the European Union and uh, the states in order to achieve carbon neutrality, since the building uh, is one of the biggest consumer of energy and uh, one of the most uh, uh, carbon uh, emissive uh, um, uh, however, uh, there's still a big uh, need for skilled labor and uh, it's one of the biggest challenges uh, right now. Um, to go further, uh, there are key resources for 3SR. Uh, you can find uh, some handbooks for competency and tools that you can uh, access uh, freely uh, to try and implement the model at uh, your local level. Uh, this uh, model will um, allow you to and uh, the way that you can implement the 3SR at your um, scale or in your region and country. Uh, we are always um, available to talk about it because uh, we are uh, really, really uh, proud of this work and we want it to go, to go further. And uh, we think that uh, the more people uh, try it and under understand it, uh, the more we can uh, develop it and make it uh, easier for households to access to renovation at uh, less costs and less waiting time. So... Thanks, Sabrine. Uh, you 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 stayed uh, audible through the whole thing until the very last sentence, <laughs> but I, I hope I hope you can still hear us. <laughs> yeah. Great, great. So there is a question for you from uh, from Liv, uh, and she wants to know about the. The funding mechanism. Um, the question is really, you know, if you're working with vulnerable households, obviously some of this work would be costly. Um, and do you expect households to to make a financial contribution to that, or do you have funding from uh, other sources or municipalities? How do you actually cover the costs of the target households? Yes. So this depends of uh, how uh, precarious they can be, uh, because in France we have some uh, stages of uh, helps that people can have from the state. And uh, for example, for the 3SR, um, our, the association Enerter, which uh, developed the concept uh, with us, um, is ta targets more poor households. So what they can do in the process is that they may 
uh, yeah, I may explain the tracer process. So you have the identification of how households that can be eligible for tracer. Second step is that you have a pre-diagnosis where you can see with the household which, um, which what are their needs, uh, what they want to change in the home, uh, what pathologies the building may have. And uh, after this, you make a, an official diagnosis with the price uh, that you estimate for the renovation. This includes uh, the, the craftsman, uh, the diagnosis time and uh, the materials, uh, and eventually the insurance and animation of the volunteers on site for the, the day of the workshop. Uh, and at that moment, the household had, has the choice to do or not do parts or all of the renovation. But during this diagnosis, um, the actors also accompany the um, household to know which help uh, for funding from the state they may have. So this depends uh, on the location of the household because they may be eligible for the help from a uh, very centralized state uh, or from uh, their local authorities, which may uh, consider that they are uh, in a geographical place that is uh, identified as uh, what we call um, urgent uh, refurbishment uh, zone. So this may help them cover like a big percentage of the, the renovation. And uh, with the most, the, the poorest households, uh, it's automatic. Um, the actors will automatically propose for them, uh, um, how to say, uh, a bill <laughs> and what they can pay at the end uh, when they uh, get all the help. And um, for the part of Les Edvons, we are uh, more targeted by people that are uh, in the middle class. So they are not socially poor, but they can be identified as energetically poor. And for these people, uh, there's also some aids that are uh, possible with the state. Um, it's especially in, at the moment where they start renovating with an objective of uh, ecological renovation. So we have some grades of uh, renovation um, and they can estimate which energy can by the renovation. And at st some states, uh, I don't remember, it's like 50% or 70%. Uh, this may uh, allow them to have many aids to, to do this renovation. Uh, and uh, it's the most, uh, it's the public that we mostly have at least at long. So I don't know if I um, answered to the, all the questions, but uh, don't hesitate to write to me. Uh, there's my email address um, and I, I will uh, have a pleasure to, to answer to you. Great. Yeah, maybe you can switch to the last slide because we don't quite see your email address yet. Um, oh, yeah. sorry, no problem. Yeah, uh, sorry, I'm. This is what. Is it stuck again? Okay, great. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Um, you know, another question that I think, or another point of what you do that's very interesting is how the community is expected to work together. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, how people collaborate on a given project? Yeah, so we have collaboration of the uh, organizations. So this can be um, associations or local authorities. Uh, and this is in the phases of the uh, identification of households and identification of the eventual aids they can have. And after this, uh, when we are uh, okay with uh, the project and uh, we start the, the renovation process, um, the part that uh, mobilizes volunteers is uh, um, managed by associations. Uh, so people can um, are there or enter the association, be members, and then they are covered by the insurance, which is very important for the workshops and um, uh, the entity that um, 
helps the household to make this project um, usually uh, has some preparation with uh, the people that uh, will open their houses because energy poverty may mm, make people fall in social uh, insulation so or isol isolation <laughs> and uh, these people uh, get often um, ashamed by inviting people at home so uh, the first uh, part of the the workshop preparation is to make them uh, in how to say to make them happy with opening their door and having people come in and work with them and this uh, will mm, reinforce the social tissue uh, in the in the local uh, scale and these people that benefited from uh, um, the participative workshop uh, get involved in the dynamic and they go to other people's houses to help them also uh, renovate and uh, much of the feedback that uh, the actors have on uh, on site is that people are happy to meet again and to to find that uh, they have neighbors that have the same problems that um, they can meet and do things that are um, positive for each other. So, for example, um, this has been formalized by Enerter in the concept of uh, a local exchange system, which makes the people earn points uh, during their participation in the workshops of others. And they may spend these points to have people come uh, at their home and help them to, to make some refurbishment or uh, um, other works on, the, on their home. And uh, this is the main part uh, or the main things we can say about the organization. And what we try to make in evidence at Les Cedvents is that this hasn't to be uh, much formalized because uh, solidarity and helping is uh, something that is inherent inherent to the nature of the human being and uh, it exists since uh, the beginning of times people always have uh, gone in communities to help each other and uh, this is why I presented the Twiza example because uh, the Twiza uh, in France is um, it's the name of a social network to make people find uh, volunteers for their workshops. It's not all about houses, but uh, it's the main subject. And the name of this network uh, is uh, inspired by the practice that is um, old from <laughs> thousands of years uh, in North Africa. And uh, the the initiators of this social network uh, have had the idea by uh, another collaborative uh, action that is, uh, I think it's Blablaka. So it's during uh, um, um, a car uh, travel share that they met someone that came from North Africa and they talked with him about their project to make some network that makes people uh, meet to do actions uh, for solidarity. And uh, the, the guy that was with them uh, in the car told them, yeah, we have a word for this in Algeria and it's called Twiza. And it started like this. And the website now is really popular in Fr France and it's uh, trans um, always transforming. Now they are one of the main um, partners for a project to develop the the something that's like quite uh, triasar and uh, at the last news i had they are planning to to work on the um, training and the uh, uh, studies about the the refurbishment and self renovation so this is uh, what i have to say about uh, community and uh, solidarity <laughs> Great, uh, thanks Sabrina. I, I, I really love your project um, and I'm hopefully we'll get to participate or at yeah, least watch, watch one soon. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I'm curious, is there, is, is there a meaning for the word Twiza? 
um i think it's a gathering or something like this i might okay. yeah uh it's uh, in berber language but i don't speak berber so uh, okay okay oh i have some berber neighbors i'll see if i can find out. yeah you can ask them <laughs> Great. Good. Good. Okay. Um, so we've now covered, you know, some of the soft and hard measures that are um, being activated and piloted and cross sharing in uh, in CIS. Uh, and Zhao has just put up the. Uh, yeah. Tell tell us a little bit about the Portuguese yeah. word. Uh, well, I, I know that in Brazil, this kind of uh, things is called mutirão, um, and that um, I'm not sure in Portugal. I think there's also a, a word for that in Portugal. That's uh, ajudada, um, and well, I, I'm pretty sure I've been seeing a lot of words in all in many countries. I as as Sabrina was saying, this is really a human thing to do to just help each other mm. in a in a mutual way. And I think that's what's very interesting about their project. It's that there's a reciprocity. Yeah. And people so yeah, I think it, uh, it's amazing. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I really like that um as you described Sabrina, but uh, is that that there's this uh, and there's an accountability for the reciprocity that people get so many points for participating in something and then they can spend those points by having other people participating in the work at their house. So there's this, you know, there's a, an accounting mechanism to, to keep track of that. Um, yeah, uh, I think it helps some, um, some shy people that weren't going to get involved in this process. And uh, some people are just ashamed. They think that um, if they get help, so they have less value. And with this point uh, system, they they can just see what they uh, earned by helping other people. So they just feel like more uh, at ease for getting mm. help. Yeah. yeah. You know, there's another interesting, we have a few minutes still in this session, and certainly if anybody else has any questions or comments, we'd love to hear from you. But there's another interesting project I'm aware of in France, which is called the uh, Le Collective des Possibles, which yeah. translates into the, the, collectivity, the collectivity of possibilities, mm -hmm. essentially. And what they recognized was that energy poverty is you know, one aspect of a whole range of challenges that these people face in their homes and in their communities. And so what they, they also recognize that a lot of these people, as, as Sabrina was saying, if you're in energy poverty, you, you often self-isolate and you're not connected to your community and you don't trust other people in your community. You don't trust your government. You don't trust energy companies. Um, and so what Le Collective des Possibles has done is create, it's, it's kind of like energy cafes, but it's not energy specifically. It's like a, a regular meeting with a group of people that they have identified as being in precarious situations and bringing them together to talk about how, you know, the, the range of challenges they face. And part of what they do within that collective is to identify who can help each other in even in small ways to do exactly what Sabrine was describing, just make somebody's home a little bit better. Um, and one of the examples they gave is at one of the events, somebody said, oh, you know, I really wish my, I'd like to paint my kitchen. And somebody else was able to say, well, I know how to paint. And so the collective was able then to help them get the paint and set up a day where people would go and, you know, the ones that knew how to paint would teach others how to paint. And so everybody gained some skills, but they all worked together on one person's house. And then it did have this effect of feeling like, well, how can we do something for the next person? Um, and I think uh, an important part of that is, you know, we're, we're, when we talk about energy, the way to solve energy problem is to, energy poverty is to come in and fix people's homes. That's a really super invasive thing to do. Um, and so I think this idea of collectives and cafes can be an, an initial step towards building the community and building the trust and getting the engagement of people and making their lives a little bit better while we're waiting for this long drawn out process of 
getting an actual renovation work started. Um, so I think those kinds of initiatives are really interesting as well. Um, any other questions or comments or would any of the speakers like to respond to what you've heard from each other? Any, does, is anybody else that's listening in? Do you have uh, unusual projects or processes that uh, can help do some of these actions or get people engaged? It's a very quiet bunch today. All right. Well, I will remind you that we will close the session a little bit early, but I will remind you that we have two more sessions coming up today at 14.45, which is in about half an hour from now. Uh, we're going to have our two presenters are going to uh, reveal their findings that have from CIS research that has been done so far <clears throat> on support mechanisms. And this is going to cover both uh, the regulatory and legal aspects of both energy communities and tackling energy poverty. And uh, we've been looking at, you know, some of the, the new initiatives that are coming out of the European Green Deal and the clean and just clean energy transition and you know the evolution of the, the the legal and regulatory frameworks over the last several years and then we're also going to talk about some work that we've done through surveys and workshops on as you saw earlier everybody is trying to figure out how to finance and fund their projects with more stability. Um, and so the second part of the next session is gonna be about that. And that's starting at 445. And then at 1600, we're gonna wrap up with a session that is really focusing on how do you measure the impact of the activities that you're engaged in? And also how do you evaluate projects overall? Um, so if nobody else has any comments or questions, um, happy to take them if you do, it's your last chance, but if you don't, we'll let everybody go early and have a bit longer coffee break, because um, I know you've all been, many of you have been here all day. Um, so any, any last words from anybody, any last words from the presenters or participants? Yeah, all right. I, I think uh, I'd be interested to know if uh, uh, in the participants, uh, they, if some of them have noticed uh, a big need in a qualified uh, craftsmen for the renovation, because uh, the the subject for us and uh, other partners uh, in France is that if you want to to get to the carbon neutrality in 2050, there's still not enough people to renovate all the, the buildings that need to be renovated. So um, I'd like to know in other countries uh, how it's perceived. From, from what I've heard, this is a really big challenge everywhere. Um, and I know that next week in, in Brussels is the Renovate Europe Day, uh, Renovation Day. And I, I wonder if this will be a topic that they will be uh, covering because it certainly is um, I, I, a presentation that I heard earlier this year was uh, about renovation work in Latvia and one of the things that they brought up was uh, you know just shortly after the war in, in Ukraine was broke out about 30 percent of the tradespeople that had been working in Latvia went back to you know defend their country and so there was suddenly a huge crisis of construction workers with, in Latvia. Um, so yeah, I think this is an interesting question for us to try to dig into some more. Yeah. Great. Any other last comments? Uh, Liv is uh, saying that she'd love to hear from anybody who has experience in directly engaging with vulnerable communities through collective energy projects. So we'll certainly keep you posted on anything we uh, come across and let you know about. Um, and just one more time, I'll encourage people to have a look at our website, which I will, you can see on the screen there, it's uh, www.energysolidarity.eu uh, and to reach out to us and let us know what, um, 
what else you're interested in learning and hearing about, or if you have a project that we should know about and should share with, uh, information with our partners. All right, so we'll see you again in about half an hour at 1445. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you so much. Bye.